You're recording now, by the way. Yeah, I, I switched it on. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And I go back to my other sharing really quick. <clears throat> Thank you. So we have our prayer for the day. Did I see Reverend uh, Bill here somewhere? Yeah. Yeah, he's he's there. I'm getting tagged with a with a, uh, a name and no, nomenclature I don't deserve. But here we go. <laughs> <clears throat> Please join me in a moment of reflection and thanks with these words. With our friends beside us and no person beneath us, with the bonds of rotary between us and our worries behind us, with our goals before us and no task beyond us, and with a thirst for knowledge and a dream of a polio-free world, we are thankful for our rotary friends and for the time we are about to share. Thank you, Bill. Mm -hmm. yeah. Jerry, are you thinking today? I'm, I'm here. Uh, I'm thought of the day, and maybe I'll do a little change to it. If you could kick the person in the pants or rear, responsible for most of your trouble, you wouldn't sit for a month. <laughs> <laughs> Probably true. Somebody's dog really <laughs> liked that too. I know. I'm going to put it on mute, but I want to give my updates, so I'm sorry. Yeah, no worries. No worries. I'm going to pop over here really quick. We were just talking about the uh, district conference, which is going to be coming up. If you haven't been to one before, it's always a fun time. This is the first time that they'll be doing it outside that I remember, maybe one time before. It's sorry, usually a two minutes. Can yeah, no problem. It's usually a multi-day event, um, but they're going to be doing it as a single day. It is on July 17th, so you want to mark your dates on the calendar, and it's going to be out at Gilroy Gardens if you haven't been there. Um, that's all pretty cool. It's a really unique and fun park. Um, Scott Smithy from Gilroy is the chairperson. He is the retired chief of police from Gilroy. Super nice guy. And Rita, I don't know if you've met him in person yet, but he's also super tall. <laughs> he would that wouldn't show on zoom but he's a really tall guy really really nice guy though um so that is coming up they are still looking for help in certain areas the house of friendship uh which is kind of a social area um they're looking for some sponsor chairs preferably with gilroy business connections um someone to help with av coordination entertainment, sergeant in arms, a speaker forum chair, and other volunteers. So you can always reach out to Scott. His email's there. Smithy, Smith with two E's on the end at, gar at garlic.com. And um, Rebecca, did you have more that you're ready to share? Apparently not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let's see. What else we have coming up? is on May 1st. I don't have a proper calendar in front of me. Um, that's a Saturday, correct? Mm -hmm. And that's our charter party. It's uh, $50 a person. We're gonna have our normal fare of steak, I believe crab, as well as the world famous Almond Valley Rotary open bar um, out at the Horseman's Association. Burke Anderson is kind of heading it up. I know he still needs some volunteers. If anybody's available, it is going to be starting. I believe we're asking people to be there no later than 2.30 uh, because we are going to watch the Kentucky Derby. The post time is a little bit before four o'clock and we're gonna be auctioning off the horses. So Chris, I see you in the other room, make a note to talk to Myron, your wife. Oh, for uh, let her know yeah. May 1st. Um, 
Are there any other announcements? Dave, you have anything as president-elect? Dave, you're muted if you're talking. Oh, here we go. Yeah. No, I, I would like to see uh, better attendance on these Zoom meetings, especially from a guy named, by the name of Ken Tavernier. I, I did see him earlier. I know he was with a client. I'm not sure if he is right now, but, right, uh, but when people, I see him, I will let him know. Right, but I, I think what people need to do, and this is what I do, I block this hour off in my Microsoft Outlook because that's what I use for my business. So people need to start doing that and you know committing to it. That's absolutely the way to do it. The way that I get Chris uh, to be here, his name is Galaxy Tab, um, is I actually buy Chris lunch every week. That's the only way I'm doing And then he, <laughs> and he's actually in the front of our office and I'm on the I'm on the inside of the office right now. So Rebecca, it looks like you are back. Are you ready to uh, share what you needed to share? Well, I think you did about the district conference, which is the 17th of July. Y'all got that information, yes. correct? Okay. Yep. So there are a few committees. I don't know if you showed all the slides, so I apologize. But I have committed Almaden Valley for two volunteers to help with registration for the day of. So I need two people to, including myself, so two additional people to help with the day of because it is a it is a team effort and it is a district effort so i would um not only is your attendance appreciated but your help and support also is to make the day fun and easygoing and run smoothly so um if you'd like to volunteer right now i'd be happy to accept that and connect you and if um i have to harass you then i will that i'll do that too Jerry, are you in town on July 17th? I think so. Because <laughs> you're really good at that particular job. I know that much. Uh, Rebecca, if I'm in town, and as far as I know, I will be, um, you know, I should be able to help. I, I can't commit today, but you can put me down as a solid possibility. Okay. I just want to show representation from our club because I think it's important if, you know, while we have... You know, not just because like you scratch our back, we scratch yours type of mentality, but you know, this this huge like playground project, which there's going to be an avenue for um, uh, us to display what we have going on and what we've accomplished. And I think our biggest thing right now is the playground project. And we're asking for quite a lot. And the least we could do is support this event with two people. Yeah, no, and for myself, sure. And myself. You know what I'll I'm start, saying? I'll, so. I'll bring to you my schedule is. Rebecca, I'm, I'm here. So, yeah, Chris? Chris said Chris said he would be happy to. And Chris, do you have a rotary shirt, a polo? No. No, I do not. Okay. Are you a small? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Uh I'm kidding. Yeah, don't worry. It's okay. It's double XL. I know. <laughs> You're funny. So I got Chris. Uh, and then also uh, uh, Greg, maybe, correct? Yeah. I could be a maybe also. Okay. Thank you, guys. Welcome. And then, um, sorry, what? July so 1st? Then, what? July 1st? Hmm. No, yeah, seven, down. July 17th, Chris. Seven, oh, seven, 17th. 17th. May, May 1st is the charter party. What oh. July 17th is the district yeah. conference. And what okay. day is that? What day is it? It's a Saturday. It is Saturday. <laughs> it's going to be 114 that day, you know? <laughs> It okay, very well so could be. I'll, I'll definitely get you a small then. <laughs> um, and then, else? like I said, there's going to be the um, like a house of friendship. I think what it's categorized, and I had never heard of that terminology before, but um, we'll need representation from our club to help 
stay at our booth during the time of that display for the uh, all-inclusive playground yeah. to yeah. articulate and so forth. So I presume it'll be, you know, uh, at minimum, Brian and Ken, but it would be nice for other representation as well. So you're saying <laughs> the play garden will be, at the, uh, will be the booth? Yeah, unless you got that, but if there's something else you wanted to add as well, where we can, I just think that that would be like just something big enough because we can use the poster boards that the city of San Jose already has and the, you know, the, the, uh, the flyers and proper like uh, publications that are already created that we could display, so. Perfect, yeah, it's a great opportunity to get the, Notoriety out for the project or yeah, information. Or... Well, and then anything I else? Shared, yeah, did you have those pictures of the letters for the seniors? Oh, you know, Rebecca, I'm, I, I saw those and I didn't pull them in. I'm sorry. So, I'll send them to Brian so they'll go in the grapevine. Okay, so what you'll see is um, what we did is one of the projects that we funded with Interact was $100 for a dollar a letter for Interact to write a letter to potential isolated seniors during, um, you know, COVID, and if you will, I don't really like that word, but, you know, can't really do much. And they created these like really creative, um, fun ways to communicate with different um, senior communities that would maybe just be alone or not receive things or you know, have correspondence or interaction with people. And so those letters have already been mailed out. And um, so there were some examples of that and that project has been finished. Cool. All right. Okay. I'm Thank done. You. Putting it back on mute. All right. So let me introduce Rita Marie Johnson, who is not only a visiting Rotarian from the Gilroy Lunch Club, which I think likes to call it the main Gilray Club, which is probably true. I think it's the one that gave birth to the other clubs. Um, but Rita's here as our, our speaker today. Um, Rita and her trainers worldwide help adults and children resolve inner turmoil and conflicts with others using the connection practice. In 2002, Rita Marie created this wellness habit for living happily with yourself and others. She taught it as a graduate course at the United Nations University for Peace, and it won the Ashoka Changemakers Innovation Award, which was chosen from 79 projects in 32 countries. Her book, Completely Connected, is an Amazon bestseller and won a Nautilus Award in the psychology category. Over 100,000 adults and children in the US, Costa Rica, Japan, and other countries have learned the connection practice and as I said before, Rita Marie is a member of Gilroy Rotary. Welcome, Rita Marie. We're looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Greg. Just one question. When you look at my screen, are you seeing the words in a way you can read them? In other words, they're not reading backwards, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. everything's correct. Yes. Okay. Plus insight equals connection. Yeah. All right. Just wanted to be sure you can read. All right, friends. Well, I'm so happy to be here, first of all, to visit uh, fellow Rotarians. And I'm um, just guessing that you may have had a lot of uh, extra stress in the last year in one way or another. Um, you know, even my dog, Millie, has been stressed. I'd like to show you a picture of my dog, Millie, here. Uh, let's see, are you seeing her? Not yet, there she is. Okay, I'm trying to get, there it is, whoops. Ah. Well, so this is Millie. This is Millie before COVID and the fire danger that we had here in Gilroy last year. So this is uh, my dog, Millie, and this is Millie now after all the stress. <laughs> so, you know, all of us have had uh, just our own challenges with dealing with stress. You know, at the same time, I'm guessing that each of you has risen to these challenges in your own way. And I imagine you may have had to dig a little deeper 
uh, to rise to challenges during COVID. Um, it's, it's really been uh, an experience that's um, tested, I think, our whole society. And we'd like to see a light at the end of that dark tunnel. <laughs> Isn't that right? So I'm just um, wondering if you've had any losses. Anybody had any losses during COVID? Or I'm wondering if you've had to face loneliness. I'm trying to see all of your hands because I'm spotlighted. Uh, but I know a lot of people have had to deal with uh, losses and loneliness. And I certainly have. My father-in-law died of COVID. And my husband recently was stuck in Costa Rica for three months trying to sell our property there at the worst possible time. <laughs> and so I was here alone in the house all that time without him and you know, isolated as we're sheltering in place. And so it was lonesome and the, the evenings felt especially really long. And yet, despite that, I was waking up inspired and motivated every day because I find that light at the end of the tunnel every day through the connection practice. Um, as Greg said, this is a practice that I created back in 2002 and I've been teaching it ever since then. And during COVID, I realized that what I've learned from it, which is to stay connected to myself and to other people is really my vaccine. <laughs> It's my vaccine for preventing loneliness and, and really anyone can learn to do it. So in thinking about loneliness during COVID, we can all understand why it's been a bigger challenge. And you know, loneliness leads to other mental health challenges. So it has definitely increased during COVID. All the statistics say that suicides are up and, and loneliness in general has been up during COVID. But you know, it was really around before COVID. It was really becoming uh, quite a problem in our society prior to COVID. Actually, research indicated that two thirds of Americans often or always felt lonely in 2019. Think about that. Two thirds of Americans often or always felt lonely in 2019, I'm wondering if that's true of Rotarians since we're all such a social bunch. <laughs> but at any rate, two thirds of Americans felt that way in 2019. But being alone doesn't necessarily mean that we're lonely and being with other people doesn't mean that we're not lonely because actually loneliness is the subjective experience of disconnection a subjective experience. So in other words, loneliness is determined by how we feel, whether we feel connected to ourselves and to others. It isn't really determined by outer circumstances, by whether we're physically alone or not. It's interesting that recent research since COVID showed that people felt lonelier initially when we were sheltering in place, but that many adapted and actually deepened their connections with others during COVID. So that's the kind of connection skill that we all need and that every human being can acquire as a vaccine for loneliness. So are you wondering what the secret is to getting that vaccine? <laughs> you know, all of us wanted to get the other kind of vaccine, but this is a vaccine for loneliness and the secret to getting it is learning to access your empathy and your insight and then combining them because there's a synergy between empathy and insight that you discover when you know how to access them and when you know how to combine them. So I'm gonna give you an example of that because that's what happened to a, a man named Lou who was in one of my courses that I was teaching. This was actually in Texas a couple of years ago. Uh, 
At that time, I was doing a demonstration of the connection practice in the front of the room, and I needed a volunteer to do that. So I said, would somebody be willing to, to volunteer to come up and share some issue that's troubling you, and I'm going to process it in the front of the room. So this man in the back of the room, Lou, he raised his hand, and he said, I'll do it. And so he stands up, Lou's a really tall, very professional looking man, very sort of commanding presence. And so Lou comes up and he sits down beside me. And I said, okay, Lou, what's going on for you? He said, well, he said, everybody thinks I'm a nice guy. He said, I'm a professional mediator. So I help people work through conflicts. And, you know, I put a smile on my face and Everybody thinks I'm just, you know, a great guy. But the truth is that I am so critical of myself and others. I mean, actually mean. I'm mean to myself and others in my inner life. Nobody knows that's what's going on, but, but that is just going on for me continually. I can never escape it. I'm so overly critical of myself and others. And um, I said, okay, Lou, well, let's, let's just start uh, working that through in the way that we do with the connection practice, which is to, to really guess what somebody is actually feeling and needing. And I said, it sounds, Lou, like you're really feeling lonely and really uh, just kind of despairing and that you really need some authenticity and, and some inner connection and connection with others. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. And then I went on just guessing what he was feeling and needing in that state of being. And I guessed, I'm wondering, Lou, if you need self-acceptance. And he said, oh yeah. He said, yeah, my old friend, self-acceptance. Uh, that's probably what it's all about, he says. I said, well, Lou, you say that self-acceptance is your old friend, but it seems that your old friend isn't really getting you there, getting you to a place of, of happiness with yourself and others. Um, so I'm just wondering, would you be willing to see if you can get an insight around that? And so Lou said, okay, yeah, I guess that's right. I, it's not really working. Even though I know it's about self-acceptance, it's not happening. So I guess I do need an insight. So I said, okay, Lou, I'm going to lead you into the three steps that are necessary to move into what's called heart-brain coherence. This is a physiological state. And uh, I'm gonna be teaching all of you a little more about that here in a few minutes with some biofeedback software. But in this case, I'd already taught Lou about this. So I said, Lou, we're going to move into heart-brain coherence. And then once you get into that physiological state, just ask yourself, what do I need to know about self-acceptance? And just reflect inside and, and see what comes. And then if something comes, please open your eyes so that I know you're complete. So I led Lou into coherence, which is focusing down into the heart, and then breathing as if breathing through the heart. And then feeling appreciation for something that's easy for you. So for myself, I use my dog Millie to move into coherence. You saw Millie. So that's the feeling that I, I use to move into this physiological state. So I guided Lou into that state. And then I just silently waited as he had his eyes closed there. And I saw in a few minutes, this big tear sliding down that long cheek. And then he opened his eyes and I said, well, did something come up, Lou? He said, yes. He said, you know, somehow I, I realized that it's not self-acceptance that I need, it's self appreciation that came to me when I was in the silence there. And then, and then somehow I, I actually felt 
appreciation for myself for the first time that I can remember. I felt it. I, I felt like I appreciated myself. And that's what it is that I need to practice. That's what I need to do is feeling self-appreciation. That's what's going to help me stop being so mean to myself and others. So that's what happened with the connection practice with Lou. He was able to shift out of profound loneliness into a state of beginning connection with himself and others. Um, so Lou asked me to share his story everywhere. Uh, that's actually his real name. I haven't made it anonymous because he said, I, I'm so grateful for this experience. I want you to, to tell many people uh, about the shift that I had. Um, but Lou's not the only one that's learned the connection practice. Uh, as Greg said in the introduction, uh, about 100,000 people have learned the connection practice now because it's taught not only by me, but by our certified coaches and our trainers around the world, especially in Japan, where we have 65 certified trainers there in Japan. So I'm going to give you another example from here in the U.S. Uh, during COVID, a grandmother in Morgan Hill called me up and she said, I've got a granddaughter who is uh, so lonely. She's been alone in the house for three months by herself. Her mom's located someplace else. And now she is threatening suicide. And I'm so worried about her. Now this grandmother, let's call her Linda, uh, had already learned the connection practice from me uh, about two years earlier. And she said, you know, I know how to do the connection practice and I think it can help my granddaughter, Ashley. But um, I, I've heard that you've got this new tool, something about magnetic boards that you're using. And I, I wanna learn about those, maybe get some of those boards before I visit Ashley. So I said, well, come on over to my office, Linda. So Linda came over and I showed her the boards that we now use to teach the connection practice. These are the steps of the practice. You put your issue here and then your feelings and your needs and your main need here. This is what we call the step of self-empathy. And then here you guess the feelings and the needs of the person that you're having conflict with if you're in conflict. Of course, in the case of Ashley, it was just her own feelings and needs. So she only needed self-empathy. But if you're in conflict with another person, you guess their feelings and needs and you guess what their main need might be. You're just trying to put yourself in their shoes. And then the steps down here are this heart brain coherence that I was telling you about in the demonstration with Lou. And so you get an insight and then you decide how you're going to act on that insight. So I went over this with Linda and what we do is we use these feelings and needs magnets, we transfer these to the other board as we're identifying our feelings and identifying our needs. So I went over those with Linda and then she went on her way to visit her granddaughter in Santa Cruz. And afterwards she told me that Linda had been able to move through her depression and to be able to get an insight about how she could immediately make her life better, make her life um, more workable for herself to be able to have some more connection with other people. So in that case, Ashley had moved from loneliness to resourcefulness. And I heard much later that she's been doing fine ever since. So this is just another example of how the connection practice can help us move out of a state of separation into a resourceful state where we're connected to ourselves and connected to others. So you might be curious about why the connection practice works so efficiently and so powerfully. And it's really because it's science-based. I'd like to share a little bit about the science now behind the connection practice. Let's do a little screen share here. So, 
This is a very quick summary of the science behind the connection practice. First of all, we know that naming feelings reduces the irrational reactions of the amygdala in the brain. I don't know if you're familiar with the amygdala, but it's that fight, flight, or freeze response. You know, when you just respond, you're, you're feeling faster than you can think. You don't even think, you just react. That's the fight, flight, or freeze response that's in our brain. It's located in the amygdala. Well, we know that when we're able to name our feelings, like if I am reacting and uh, I'm angry, the moment I say, I feel angry, it actually helps me to reduce my anger because the amygdala of my brain is screaming at me, Rita Marie, you're angry. And the moment I say, I feel angry, that part of my brain goes, okay, you heard me. I don't need to scream at you anymore. So naming our feelings immediately reduces that charge. And then this physiological state called heart-brain coherence also helps us to reduce those irrational reactions. The moment that we move into heart-brain coherence, the charge is greatly reduced. We're no longer reactive. Number three, naming our needs requires taking the other person's perspective, which is cognitive empathy. That's a very important aspect of social emotional intelligence. So when we're able to name our own needs or, or guess the other needs, or guess the needs of the other person, then we're, we're taking a step back. We're getting perspective. We're looking at the underneath reason why we've been reacting. And then lastly, heartbrain coherence brings about what we call positive affect or what you could call a good mood. And we know from the science that this increases our access to insights or what you could just call our best thinking, that we're just trying to get out of the way what we don't want and access what we do want. We want to get out of the way our reactions and we wanna access our best thinking for making choices. So to, uh, to learn this heart-brain coherence that I've been telling you about, we have biofeedback software on our phones. I simply put this sensor into my iPhone and I'm going to get to the software here. This is software from the HeartMath Institute. I put this sensor on my ear like this. I would have to take my earring off actually, but I put the sensor on my ear and then this biofeedback software will measure if I'm in low coherence or stressed, then you're gonna see a red dot here. If I'm in medium coherence, then this little dot will turn blue. And if I'm in high coherence, if I'm really just peaceful and thinking at my best, I'll get a little green dot here. So this is a fabulous invention <laughs> because you can measure how coherent you are all day long, you know, you can put it on your ear while you're driving. You don't have to look at it while you're driving, but afterwards you have a record of how coherent you were when you were in terrible traffic or whatever's going on for you. So this is a way to practice getting and staying coherent. And we know from the science that when the heart and brain are working together, when they're in sync, that is when we're able to think at our best. We have all kinds of evidence of this. And let me show you just one study that shows you why coherence is so beneficial. This is a study that was done with 11,903 healthcare professionals from different settings, hospitals and clinics and so on. So HeartMath that invented this software, they're located here in California, they went in and did a survey of these individuals and you see 45% were tired, 31% exhausted, 9% depressed, 24% anxious, 23% annoyed and 10% angry. Then after they learned to get coherent, which is what heart math teaches, this simple process that I demonstrated with Lou, heart focus, heart breathing, heart feeling of appreciation, after learning that and practicing it for six weeks, only 26% were tired, 16% exhausted, 4% depressed, 13% anxious, 10% annoyed, and 4% angry. 
a tremendous improvement in mental and emotional well being. Now, when I was sharing the science, one of the things that um, it said is that when we're in this state of coherence, is that we're able to more successfully access our insights, our best thinking. And uh, so I wanna just share a little example from my own life. Um, several years ago, um, I was single, actually I'd been single for 10 years. And uh, so I, I started dating once I moved to Gilroy. And um, I uh, dated several people and then I, I dated a fellow named Ricardo. And uh, after several dates, I decided, oh, you know, this guy's just not for me. Uh, I said to him, you know, let's just be friends. You know, I'd love to have you as my friend. So um, then one night I was at home and I was kind of lonesome. Uh, and so I decided to see if I could access an insight about finding a companion. After 10 years of being single, I was really ready to have a companion in my life again. And so, I went into coherence, which is focusing down in the heart, breathing as if breathing through the heart, and then feeling appreciation for something that's easy for you. And I mentioned that I use my dog Millie to move into coherence. And so I was in this coherent state and I just ask, what do I need to know about finding a companion? And what came to me was, you turned him away. Ricardo's the one. Clear as a bell. <laughs> and so I had to go back to Ricardo and say, you know, I would like a do over. You know, I'd like to try this again. And so uh, now Ricardo and I are very happily married. I'll uh, just show you a picture of my beloved here. We got married in. Uh, 2019 and whoops where'd it go oh my gosh did I lose it <laughs> I did uh, golly I thought I had it here in this set but at any rate um, I've been married very happily since 2019 and I'm so grateful for having learned how to access an insight because I could have just gone on my merry way, you know, dating many other people and, and, uh, and I would have missed the, the, the tremendous joy of getting to know my husband. So the connection practice is actually easy to learn. Um, it, is, it isn't difficult. And so some people might think that it's, you know, superficial or it's, uh, you know, just something that um, you use, uh, to resolve relatively easy things, but, but that's not the case actually. The connection practice is really the profound made practical. Um, and so I'm gonna share one more example of it. Not long ago, a woman um, called me, let's call her Jan. And Jan is a single mother. She uh, lost her job during COVID. She has two teenage daughters that she adopted as babies from Guatemala. And now they're teenagers. And during the sheltering in place with no money and two teens in the house with nothing to do, she was just going nuts. She called me and said, I've heard about this connection practice and I'm so desperate, I need some help. And so I said, okay, well, let me teach you the connection practice. And so I mailed her some boards so she could learn to do it. And I invited her to a course, I scholarshiped her to a course. And, um, and so she learned the connection practice. About a week later, she calls me and she says, you would not believe what happened. She said, my oldest daughter, Audrey, is a germaphobe. She's been a germaphobe all her life, scared to death of germs. And she said, I've tried to talk her out of it. I've said, you know, don't give germs that power. You know, you've got a strong immune system. There's no reason for you to be afraid of germs, but it never had any impact, she said. So Jan said that 
Audrey is a food service worker in a nursing home. And Audrey that week received the news that they had their first COVID case in the nursing home. So Audrey went to her mother and said, mom, I cannot go to work. I am not going back there. I am scared to death. I, I cannot face those germs. I am not going. So, you know, Jan was worried because financially, you know, uh, she was getting unemployment and they really needed that income and she didn't want her daughter to be scared. And she said, well, honey, let's see if we can work this out on these connection practice boards instead of worrying about it. Let's just see if we can work through what you're feeling and what you're needing. And so Jan took her boards and she began to work with her daughter, Audrey, and worked on all of her feelings of being scared and worried and uh, upset about going back. And she put all these feelings up there. And then they started identifying all of her needs. And I'm just gonna cut to the chase here. They came up with the fact that her main need was physical safety. So Jan said, okay, honey, well, um, let's see if you can get an insight about this. So Jan had learned how to guide her daughter into heart-brain coherence. And so Audrey went into coherence to seek an insight. And when she opened her eyes, Jan said, did you get something, honey? And she said, well, yes. She said, I realized actually what I'm afraid of is death. I'm really just scared of dying. So Jan said, all right, well, let's just put death up here. Let's just say, I'm scared of death and go through all your feelings and your needs around that. So they did that. What was scary for her, actually terrifying. And then her needs around that. And this time when they processed the needs, what she said is my need is connection. She said, what, I, what really scares me about death is I'm going to lose connection with everybody I love. Hope you all can see that. I don't want to lose connection with everybody. So her mother said, okay, well, let's see if you can get an insight about that. And so she went into coherence and she opened her eyes and she said, well, I realized that, you know, what it is, is I, I lost connection with grandma. Grandma always just made me feel so connected in our family. And when she died, I lost connection with her. And, and that's really what this is about. So Jan, the mother said, okay, well, let's just put up here when grandma died, how you felt and what you needed. And so she went through it again. And this time when she got to the main need, she said, you know, mom, it's really that grandma helped me feel like I belong, you know, because, uh, you know, I'm adopted and grandma just helped me feel like I belong here. And um, so Jan said, well, honey, let's see if you can get an insight about that. And so one last time, Jan led her daughter into coherence. So Audrey's got her hand on her heart, listening for an insight. And then she opens her eyes and she says, mom, it's all because my birth mother gave me away. That's what's at the bottom of all of this. I never realized that before. It's because she gave me away. I've just been, had this fear all my life that I don't belong. I'll be disconnected from everybody. But right now, mom, I feel like I belong to you more than I ever have because you helped me work all of this through. And you know, I can go back to work now. I don't feel afraid anymore. I can go back to work. So that's why, friends, we call the connection practice the profound made practical. That in just one session, this mother was able to help her daughter release a lifelong fear. So I don't want to 
uh, exaggerate, the connection practice is not a cure-all, not at all. But one of my students said, well, that's right, Rita Marie, it's not a cure-all, but it is a cure-a-lot. <laughs> and it is. And you know, friends, in this time, in our society, when we have so many challenges, we don't have enough counselors for everybody. We don't have enough therapists and people don't have the money to pay for a therapist in our time. And so with the connection practice, we can learn to process these things ourselves. We can get to the heart of issues by combining our empathy and insight. We can work it out for ourselves and we can help those we love work it out as well. We can reach out to, to others and without training as a counselor or a therapist, we can still be helpful. We can reach out and help the people around us, whether they're feeling lonely or anxious or depressed, you know, we can help when we know how. It's something that every human being can learn. And it is my hope and my prayer and my dream that children everywhere can learn the very basics of being able to name their feelings and needs and be able to access their best intelligence for making choices. Just imagine friends, if we could just teach one generation that, how many things could change? So I hope you all uh, pass on the word that the connection practice is available. I'd like to put into the chat um, some information here about if you wanna learn the connection practice that you can um, go to our website uh, and the, the link there is uh, for my next course. I'll teach a course online on May 8th. So if anybody's interested in learning the connection practice, you can join us online uh, or go to my website, connectionpractice.org to learn more about what we do. This is nonprofit work. I founded a nonprofit in the United States back in 2009. Prior to that, I worked in Costa Rica. I started this whole thing in Costa Rica. So. I'll pause here for any questions. I know we're just about out of time. Yeah, no, thank you, Rita Marie. Anybody have any questions? I know Rebecca had a meeting. So she had to, uh, she just loved off about 45 seconds ago. <clears throat> it's very interesting, you know, a, a whole different approach to, I mean, self-help obviously, but um, I don't know if I was aware of being able to do something like this, which is a simple process, right? It is. That's the really the beauty of it is, you know, we go around and around and around in our heads about these things. When if we just stop, write down what's triggering us, what do I feel? What do I need? And what do I need to do? What's the insight that I need to be able to move forward consciously? Yeah, that's no, fascinating. Fascinating. Anybody have any, any questions or comments? No, everybody's muted. Bill, do you, you're muted still, Bill. Yeah, the only question I would have, I, obviously, uh, or it seems to me that one of the first steps is the person who is going to be involved has to be the one who initiates contact and comes in to you. Is that right? I mean, if you, if you see someone who needs help, you have to first convince them to come into the process. Is that correct? Yes. Um, and of course, the way that we would convince them is by giving them empathy verbally. In other words, yes, we'd like to, you know, sit down with the boards and do a session. But, uh, you know, I would just say, you know, are you feeling really lonesome and really needing some support? Uh, you know, would you be willing to try something new that is, completely self-empowering. You see, the thing about the connection practice is we don't give any advice. We don't tell anybody what they're feeling or needing. It's completely self-empowered. It is their feelings and needs. It is their heart-brain coherence. It is completely self-empowered, so there's no threat. It's not like when they you know, enter into a situation with one of our coaches or trainer, trainers, they know that nobody's going to be telling them what to think or, or what to do. I didn't mean to come up. 
That's that's actually very powerful, I think. Yeah, very different. Thank you. That's cool. Any other questions? Yeah, what does her husband really look like? <laughs> you know, I can't believe he's left out of my PowerPoint here. I, I thought, sure, I had him in here because I've shown this to other rotaries. Well, he's... Um, uh, Oh gosh, you you really want to see him? <laughs> is he is he uh, Latin? Yes, yes he is, Ricardo Balderas. <laughs> uh, yes, he's got his uh, he got his PhD uh, from USF in multicultural education. He was an edu educator all his life. He was a principal, um, and uh, and he's just fabulous. And how in the world? Let's see, maybe it's in this one. Here he is, I got it. Hold on just a minute and I'll show you. Mm -hmm. I, I guess it was a different rotary presentation that I'd done it. Here we go. Don't lose him. Uh, right, don't lose him. Let's see if I got it, it's this one. Okay, let's see, here we go. I got it. It's on. Right here. Oh, there, there you go. There's my hey. husband. He's with a young, a younger chick now. <laughs> Who is that? Is that you? That's me. That was me in 2019. Yeah. What a nice wedding. All right. Yeah, yeah, that's us in the butterfly. Anyway. That's we awesome. Well, thank you very much, Rita Marie. <laughs> um, thank you for sharing. Thank you for being part of, of the Rotary family. That's awesome. And uh, I'm sure you're looking forward to being able to meet with your club in person. <laughs> yes, I am. I'd love to get to know them in person. Absolutely. Yeah. That's great. Cool. All right. Well, we are going to sign off. Let me stop recording. I hit, I lost the.